Thank you and welcome uh, on this very special occasion, this very special evening. In 1911, Houston was 75 years old, and it had a lot going for it. It had an economy based on oil and agriculture. It was a prosperous regional hub. It had a population of 80,000 people and growing rapidly. At the same time, Austin, San Antonio, even tiny College Station had universities, and Houston had none. But that was all about to change thanks to the generosity of a transplanted New Englander by the name of William Marsh Rice, who came to Houston in 1839, a youth of 20 years old, uh, he soon became one of Houston's most successful businessmen, and as the 1900s approached, he was actually one of the wealthiest men in Texas. Twice married and twice widowed, the childless Mr. Rice began to think what he was going to do with this enormous fortune that he had created. And he remarked to his friend, colleague, and attorney, Captain James Baker, that Texas received me, a penniless youth, someone who had no friends, not even acquaintances, and in the evening of my life, I have an obligation to her and her children. And thus, he announced the founding of the William Marsh Rice Institute for literature, science, and art. After he died, Captain Baker became the first chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Rice Institute. And thanks to great work by the trustees and to, our, to their great credit, they shaped the successful beginning of the institution, and most especially, they recruited and supported the, our founding president, Edgar Odell Lovett, whose vision then still influences us today and for whom is named the building uh, behind me. It is now my pleasure to introduce David Liebron, the seventh president of Rice University, uh, a man whose ambitious and inspiring vision for the second century echoes Lovett's vision a century ago, and who in every respect is a worthy successor of Edgar O'Dell Lovett. David? Thank you, Jim. When you get an introduction like that, the best thing is to sit down and shut up. But I do want to welcome all of you tonight. Many things amaze me about the founding of our university. As many of you know, this is not where it was originally envisioned to be. There was a plot secured downtown, a relatively small plot, I think about eight acres. Out here, and try to imagine this, was basically prairie land. In fact, probably some swamp land, although I'm forbidden to say that by our public affairs department. Somewhere over there, I think, was a pig farm. And so just try to imagine this at the time, outside this town of 80,000, this was barely part of the town. And Rice had this opportunity, or Edgar O'Dell Lovett and the board, had this opportunity on this plot of land downtown to build their new university. There was nothing out here. The road ended some miles to the, to the north. None of the beautiful neighborhoods you see today. No buildings. And so it was pretty bold and audacious that they would come out here and assemble nearly 300 acres. And what that represented, although Houston didn't have that much in way of modern city at the time, what it had and I dare say still has, was people of bold vision and ambition. 
as Edgar O'Dell Lovett said, the founding ceremonies, what they sought was an institution that aspired to university standing of the highest grade. And this building that we celebrate today, as you admire the building, it was designed to represent that level of ambition. And if you haven't read the beautiful piece that Melissa King published in the Houston Chronicle this past weekend, I suggest you do so, because I can't capture that spirit and importance and what this building was intended to represent in terms of ambition for the future. I see some of you staring at the building. The amazing thing about it is you can stare at this building for a very long time, and it remains beautiful. And Lovett was emphatic that the new university would be intimately connected with the city of Houston. In a 1910 address to a group of Houston businessmen, he said, I believe that the new institution is to play a role in Houston similar to that of the newer universities which have risen recently in the centers of northern England. Those modern universities aim at uniting the study of pure science with its applications to industry and commerce. They seek to dif differentiate themselves from schools of technology by giving due and sufficient place to humanities and liberal arts. Concern about the needs of the city of Houston were also to have a profound effect on how the university developed with emphasis at the beginning on science and technology. The immediate needs of Houston at the time helped determine the original curriculum. As the city matured, so did its great university. In the decades that followed, Rice grew and expanded into many areas of research and study, becoming not just Houston's first university, but ultimately recognized as one of the leading research institutions of the world with a reputation that today extends across the globe. Today, 100 years after the intellectual vision for Rice first began to become a physical reality, our connection with our home city remains just as strong. It was part of the vision for Rice before the first dirt was dug to lay this building and remains part of our fundamental vision for the future today. That connection to Houston is so well represented in our speakers this evening, who represent the impact that Rice has had on our city, the state, and the country as a whole. As I like to put it, it is gratifying that after almost 100 years, all of Harris County and the city of Houston is under Rice control. <laughs> and so it is now my pleasure to introduce one of our most distinguished graduates, former member of the Texas House of Representatives and commissioner of the Interstate Commerce Commission, currently the chief executive of the nation's third most populous county, a leader in times of crisis, as we saw during Hurricane Ike, also serving as director of Homeland Security and Emergency Management for Harris County. Please join me in welcoming our graduate, Ed Emmett. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, I might quibble over the term control, <laughs> but tonight I won't quibble over much of anything. You know, there probably was a county commissioner who built the road out to Rice, uh, so I have to put in that plug for the county. If you think back about it, you know, Harris County, city of Houston, we're, we're now 50 times the size of what we were 100 years ago. And what I want to bring to you tonight is from my perspective. All of us have seen the photographs of when Lovett Hall was being built. None of these trees were here, as, as President Lebron pointed out. 
but none of the students were here either. And for those of you who were at last year's State of the County speech, when I ask uh, Mayor Parker to introduce me, and she'll be introduced later on video, I, I went back to the Ken Burns Civil War series that he did on public television. And if you remember at the beginning of that, there was a quote from Oliver Wendell Holmes where he was talking about his generation and he said, we have shared the incommunicable experience of war. Well, I told the crowd gathered at the Hilton America's Hotel that day that the reason I wanted Denise to introduce me was because we had shared the incommunicable experience of rice. A little bit like war. <laughs> the students back there laughed a lot harder at that, by the way. Now, recently Gwen and I watched The Trust. Uh, Doug Kilgore gave me a copy of it, and I went home that night and watched it. And, and you did get the passion for the, the students, that that's what it was all about. And I can tell you, as someone who grew up for the most part in the East Texas oil field and came here on a Teagle Foundation scholarship, uh, I would not be who I am without Rice University. There's no question about that. But what is amazing about Rice, when you think about the fact that currently the University of Texas has as many students as there are living alums from Rice University, we're a small group. But what was created here was really a family. And it's a family that belongs not only to this institution, but to this community. Everywhere I go in Harris County and around the state of Texas, I not only run into people who went to Rice, they knew somebody that went to Rice, or they talk about just what a great resource Rice University is for the community, for the state, and for the entire nation. To put it, I guess, in the best perspective I can, when we decided to move back from Bethesda, Maryland in 2003, Gwen and I knew that we wanted to live in this area. And one of the reasons, quite simply, was to be close to Rice University. It gives you a feeling of commitment, of strength, and while it's got such a rich heritage, I know as we stand here and celebrate the 100-year anniversary of the laying of the cornerstone, all of us really want to know what's it going to be 100 years from now. And we know that it's still going to be family, it's still going to be a tremendous resource, and it will be even better known. So thank you for letting me share this evening. Our other RISE graduate who helps us control our media environment, Marinese Parker, unfortunately couldn't be here tonight due to a conflict in her schedule. But she did provide for us the following video message. Good evening. I'm sorry that I can't be there with you tonight on Founders Court to celebrate the 100th anniversary of laying the cornerstone for Rice University's Lovett Hall. However, I did want to let you know how much this event means to me, and not just because I'm a Rice graduate. Houston is a city that welcomes entrepreneurs. It's a city built on dreams, but those dreams are powered by hard work, cooperation, common sense, and creativity. That spirit attracted William Marsh Rice to Houston the same year that the city itself was founded and later inspired him to repay his hometown, or his adopted hometown, by establishing the Institute of Higher Learning that became what you see before you tonight. New Rice students enter through Lovett Hall Sally Port at matriculation, and New Rice graduates exit the same portal at graduation. They enter Rice smart and eager to learn, 
They depart wiser and ready to lead. While they are here as students, and in many cases after they graduate, they enrich the fabric of our great city. And for that, I celebrate Rice. Happy 100th birthday, Levitt Hall. May your second century be as meaningful as your first. And last in our tributes, I've been asked to read a letter from a former, if brief, Rice faculty member who also could not be here with us this evening. Barbara and I send our warmest wishes to all those gathered on Founders Court to celebrate Rice and the centennial of Lovett Hall. I recall fondly the days I spent in this magnificent and historic building with the leaders of many of our nation's closest allies and trading partners during the 1990 World Economic Summit. For me, it was a double pleasure. Not only did the gathering allow me to proudly introduce these world leaders, and with them, the worldwide media, to my hometown, it also brought me back to the campus where I had spent a very happy year of my professional life as a faculty member of Rice's then brand new Jesse H. Jones Graduate School of Business. Of course, over the years, both Barbara and I have been on the Rice campus many times for athletic events, performance at the University Shepherd School of Music, and lectures sponsored by the James A. Baker III Institute for Public Policy. Our most memorable visit was on a day in May of 1998 when Barbara and I watched our oldest grandchild, George P. Bush, cross the stage in the academic quadrangle in front of Lovett Hall to accept his Rice Diploma. The cornerstone of Lovett Hall became the foundation for higher education in Houston, and thus an essential building block for the steady improvements in reputation and prosperity that our region has enjoyed in the past 100 years. As Houstonians, as Texans, and as Americans, I believe we all have reasons to be grateful for the legacy of Rice's founder, William Marsh Rice, and its founding president, Edgar Odell Lovett, and to celebrate Rice. With best wishes for a wonderful event, George Bush. In a few moments, we will have a video that provides historical perspective on Lovett Hall. Following that video, we will ask representatives of the city, county, and Rice University to come forward and lead us in singing Happy Birthday to Lovett Hall. I was skeptical of this idea at the beginning of saying Happy Birthday to a building. But once I knew that the mob would be joining us, I knew they would somehow make it completely appropriate. <laughs> then we hope you will all pass through the Sally Port, although some of our students, as a matter of culture and maybe even superstition, may elect to walk around the building and join us for a birthday cake in the academic quadrangle. passage through which for nearly half a century thousands of students have entered into university life. But this picture is about what lies beyond the Sally Port. Symbolizing the living past of the Institute, a statue of the founder overlooks the earliest part of the campus to have been developed. The first quadrangle and the nucleus of buildings including Lovett Hall which was ready for the inaugural ceremonies held in 1912. 
In leaving his entire fortune to Rice Institute, William Marsh Rice wrote into the history of the state the first conspicuous example of the complete dedication of a large fortune to the public good. I want us to try to, to try to move back in time and imagine what the trustees thought they were doing and what they attempted to do and what Lovett did at the very beginning of this century. I think you all know the story of William Marsh Rice who you know, came here from 1837 from Massachusetts and subsequently made a fortune and uh, established in 1891 something called the, the William Marsh Rice Institute for the Advancement of Literature, Science and Art, saying nothing was to be done until he died. And he just kept on making money and living. And you all know the story how he was murdered. And so in 1900, he's dead. And so the trustees that he had put together in 1891 to, to, in some sense, supervise the building of this institute, all of a sudden had the opportunity and the challenge to make real what was sort of a paper institute. And I don't think they really understood the amount of money that was involved. They knew he was a wealthy man. They didn't quite know how wealthy. After his death, the money becomes a little about 1904-1905, and it's about $7 million. It's, it's one of the sixth or seventh largest endowment in the nation. The potential is too great not to do it right. But how to do it right? They were not academicians. They didn't have a lot of experience. They had already begun teaching themselves by early 1900 by riding around to various law firms asking about how do you organize such an institution? Uh, what, what are your purposes? And they began to, they realized they need to find what they call a young man who would be the head of this institute. And they began to write letters to the presidents of the major American universities and to politicians and Supreme Court judges and so forth asking what are the characteristics we should look for in the head of this new institution. And if you have somebody you'd recommend, recommend them. Woodrow Wilson, then president of Princeton, recommended one of his faculty, a young mathematician and astronomer named Edgar Odell Lovett. When the trustees selected him as the first president of Rice Institute, Lovett persuaded them to send him on a tour of the world's leading universities. Everywhere he went, Lovett interviewed educators, sought nominations for prospective faculty, and piqued the world's curiosity about the exciting new institution being planned. When he returned, Lovett was prepared to spell out a vision of the new institute. It would start small, but its aspirations were grand. This was not to be a provincial local college, but a university of the first rank. Because Houston was still a small town in a developing region, Rice would focus on science and engineering at first. Yet from the very beginning, both technical and liberal learning were included. And as the region matured, Rice would slowly realize its larger purposes. To plan the campus and design the first buildings, Lovett and the trustees selected a distinguished architect, Ralph Adams Cram of Boston. At first challenged by the flat, almost treeless track of land that was to be the campus, Cram soon created a new style of architecture, combining a variety of Mediterranean motifs and buildings set in a series of academic quadrangles. From the very beginning, the university projected a sense of physical beauty that embodied its high ambitions. So, after several years of careful planning, on March 2nd, 1911, the 75th anniversary of the Texas Declaration of Independence, the cornerstone for the Rice Institute Administration Building was laid, and the new university officially put down roots in Texas soil. By the fall of 1912, the first buildings had been completed, 12 faculty recruited, and 59 students matriculated. Here on the edge of the city, what must have seemed almost the edge of civilization to some of the faculty, Mr. Rice's dream had come to fruition. Julian Huxley wrote to his countrymen in England, trying to explain the astounding fact of a great new university housed in magnificent buildings far away on the Texas frontier. We were confronted by an extraordinary spectacle. The administration building was before us, looking almost as if it had risen miraculously out of the earth. It seemed as new and real as a new species of bird of paradise lit on in a New Guinea jungle. Here it stood, brilliant, astounding, enduring. Every now and then I, I think of what this university must have looked like in 1912, 1914, when the trees were being planted and the buildings were being built. It was a marshy area lying on the extreme outskirts of a tiny town in southeast Texas. There were very few trees here, and uh, there were no neighborhoods. 
Uh, they were unpaved roads. They obviously had a dream, and the dream grew. President Lovett's vision for Rice was materialized in the architecture of the administration building, which was subsequently renamed Lovett Hall in his memory. When Rice was first opened, President Lovett came here from Princeton. And there's a cornerstone over there on the administration building written in Greek. And it, roughly the translation is, rather said Democritus or somebody, would I be the discoverer of new, one new fact than to be king of the Medes and the Persians? Now that was written at a time when king of the Medes and the Persians was the top dog in the world. And I love it emphasized the scholastic side of Rice. He wanted Rice to be top in teaching and research. He, he talked about it, and he really meant it, and he convinced some of us that it was important. Passing into the Sally Port, there are the four faces carved into the corners of the arch, beginning with the excited freshmen. Then, as they become more mature and self-possessed, the sophomore, the junior, and finally the graduating senior. Now, the thing that I see more people looking at on campus than anything else are these capitals, which were carved again on the site. There are four capitals just like this one. Now up here on the left, for example, we have the co-ed. And in the middle is the student with his book in his lap, but his attention seems to have been distracted because he's looking in her direction. Then on the right we have a football player, and he seems to be running in her direction also. Over the course of the next hundred years, Rice grew slowly, and Houston grew explosively. But despite being a relatively small school, Rice's students and faculty accomplished great things, and the city of Houston definitely prospered as a result. Uh, arguably, the Johnson Space Center wouldn't be here except for the efforts of uh, two Rice University classmates and maybe roommates, I've heard, George R. Brown and uh, Albert Thomas, Congressman Albert Thomas, who were very instrumental in getting the Johnson Space Center located here in Houston. And of course, Rice University donated the land that the Johnson Space Center uh, is built on. So we've had a long uh, relationship with Rice University that we're quite proud of down here. Rice was founded as a university dedicated to letters, science, and art. And we shouldn't overlook the university's contributions to the arts. Dr. Lovett was a founding board member of the Houston Symphony. And this season, more than a third of our orchestra are either alumni or faculty members of Rice's Shepherd School of Music. The building for the Museum of Fine Arts Houston was designed by William Ward Watkin, who founded the Rice Architecture Program, and the museum's founding director, James Chilman Jr., was also a Rice Architecture professor. Roy Hoffines went to Rice for a year, so he's a Rice alum, uh, held this same office. He was county judge of Harris County. Uh, he built the Houston Astrodome. Uh, of course, Mr. Hoffines was part of the group that brought professional baseball to Houston, too. Uh, our city in Harris County would be very different were it not for Rice. Rice is an extraordinary asset to the city of Houston. Its partnership with the medical center and the research that is going on, uh, the fact that it's an idea generator for the community, Steve Kleinberg's Houston survey that's done every year, which has an enormous impact on the thinking about where the city is going and the region is going where it needs to go. Not to mention the people from Rice who have stayed in Houston and made contributions, whether it's in the law, engineering, architecture, government. I mean, right now, uh, we have a mayor who's a Rice graduate, we have a county judge who's a Rice graduate, and for better or worse, we have a metro president who's a Rice graduate. Of course, Lovett Hall is only a symbol of Rice, but it's a very important symbol. It's where the Office of Admissions has been located since the university first opened. Of course, Lovett Hall was the first thing that I saw, and I remember going up the steps, up the steps to see the uh, admissions person, and remembering how old this building must be because the steps were <laughs> sloped and you had to kind of watch what you did. And, and in fact, I, I came up those same steps uh, 12 years ago when I first, when I attended my first meeting as a trustee of Rice University. Uh, I also remember uh, when Kerry Cronice would make his famous speech to the incoming freshman, look to your left, 
look to your right. <laughs> Only one of the three of you will graduate. I, I thought that, you know, if I don't make it, uh, I'll probably know because they would summon me to Love It Hall. <laughs> the university's alumni magazine was originally called the Sallyport, and the newsletter of the Rice Historical Society is still known as the Cornerstone. The building is used by hundreds of brides each year as the backdrop for the most important photographs of their lives. And it's indirectly the reason that Rice has one of the most distinguished schools of architecture in the country. My father was William Ward Watkin who came to Houston in 1910 from Boston to um, supervise the building of the first building of Rice University. And Dr. Lovett and Daddy were reading the cornerstone and they said, this school will be dedicated to letters, science, and art. And my father turned to Dr. Lovett and said, well, you've got letters and you've got lots of science, but where's your art? Dr. Lovett said, well, I don't know. And Daddy said, well, I'll tell you, I'll be glad to start a little small school of architecture and that'll be your art. So that was Daddy immediately offered to, to teach. The Rice Institute is a theater of action, a grove for reflection, a laboratory of discovery, a library of knowledge, a field for sport, a hall for speech and song, a home for complete living. President Lovett's office was on the fourth floor. Alluding to that fact and the involvement of William Ward Watkin in its construction, Hubert Bray, who earned Rice's first PhD in mathematics in 1918, composed a poem about Lovett Hall. A great man is Edgar O. Lovett. His office has nothing above it. It's four stories high, as close to the sky, as William Ward Watkin could shove it. So oh, this is actually where President Edgar O'Dell Lovett himself had his office. This is the home of the Kinder Institute for Urban Research, whose central mission is to not only do first-class sociological research, but also to use that research to inform and inspire the communities in which it's based. Lovett Hall really is the quintessential iconic image of Rice. It's at the center of campus life in all sorts of ways, and it's been seen and admired all around the world. She's imagining that you're graduating. Congratulations, Elmo. Oh, thank you, Principal Elmo. <laughs> ah. Yay! And then you can celebrate by <laughs> dancing. Aja aja jind shami aane ke tale hai Aja zari wale nile azmane ke tale hai Jai ho! Jai ho! Jai ho! Jai ho! Then President George Bush chose Rice as the site for the 1990 World Economic Summit. It was a nice way to direct a little world attention to his adopted hometown of Houston. But in the late 1970s, Mr. Bush was one of the original faculty members at Rice's Jones School of Business. And we've had other Rice faculty who've made fairly significant contributions. Well, of course, one of the newer initiatives uh, at Rice University was the establishment, is the uh, existence of the James A. Baker the Third Institute for Public Policy. It was an idea that was just germinating when I was still provost and then all of what's really happened uh, in the extraordinary development of the Baker Institute happened while I was in Washington. So uh, I certainly could take zero credit for that. Uh, uh, it's remarkable how quickly this institute has made its mark nationally and internationally. I've been at Rice more than half the time uh, that Lovett Hall has existed more than 50 years. And they, um, in that time, I've seen a lot of changes in Houston and a lot of changes in Rice. I've never, you know, in all this time, Lovett Hall really hasn't changed. Live 
from the insides of a nanotube model. They're constructing what could be, should be, and would be the largest nanotube model ever built it, to this date, I think. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, the next uh, short speaker is uh, Rick Smalley, the founder of the Center for Nanoscale Science and Technology some, technology some 12 years ago. And uh, Rick, with, uh, along with Robert Curl, Bob, Bob is here right there. Um, won the uh, 1996 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for this, the discovery of the baby brother of the nanotube that we've made. This is the Buckyball. Boy, this is uh, supremely silly. I really enjoy it. Uh, this turns out to be not just any uh, carbon nanotube. Uh, this is the tube that's the direct extension of the Buckyball. If you cut it halfway in the middle and you start putting hexagons around it, you get a capsule. The first step along that road is C70, which Bob Curl and I and Harry Croto and uh, Jim Heath and Sean O'Brien discovered uh, in 85 here at Rice just on the campus. So we have a big project going on right now to make tubes specifically of this geometry and to spin them into wires. And we're confident that will have a huge effect. In any event, thank you for being at this wonderfully silly event. <laughs> Rice University was William Marsh Rice's gift to Houston. But in many ways, it's also Houston's gift to the world. Many Houstonians have supported and continue to support the university's mission. I think at least as much about what Houston has done for Rice as what Rice has done for Houston. I mean, it, it's really striking to me as a first a trustee and then as chairman how much Houston appreciates rice and how much Houston brags about rice and how proud it is and how generous people have been toward rice and how supportive of everything rice does. So I think a lot about what Houston has meant to rice uh, along with what rice has meant for Houston. And I think truly at the 100 year mark we are obviously only part way through the journey. I'm proud to be part of the Rice University community and look forward to the university's centennial celebrations starting with the 100th anniversary of construction on Levitt Hall. As a Rice board member, I attend meetings in Levitt Hall, sitting in the same room where Rice trustees of the past met to chart the course for the university's first 100 years. Looking toward the university's second century, I look forward to being a part of a tremendous and talented team of students, faculty, alumni, and community leaders who will undoubtedly achieve enormous successes in research, business, education, and athletics. I'm Rodney Ellis. I'm a Texas State Senator, and um, I represent Rice University. I also live near Rice University, and Rice has been such an important part of Texas history. You just think of so many people who've gone on to be very influential in business and politics and the arts and Rice University was where they started. Who would have thought uh, that a hundred years later, Rice University would be the powerhouse that it is? Uh, historically, it has been one of the most prestigious universities in the country, always been the flagship, so to speak, of the state of Texas. Uh, so Rice University is very, very much involved uh, with the Johnson Space Center, always has been and always will be, and we're very proud of that relationship. Well, from the very beginning, the relationship between Rice and Houston has been important to Rice University and really part of its founding vision. We benefit today from being in the, really in the center of this great city. And in, uh, if you think about this campus, nearly 300 acres of a beautiful wooded campus, really in the center of the nation's fourth largest city, that's just remarkable. As much as Rice benefits from its location in the city. We believe also from the beginning that the city of Houston has benefited uh, from the presence here of what ultimately became one of the nation's best universities. Uh, the city benefits from the research support that we can provide from our continuing education program through the Glasscock School of Continuing Studies, from the discoveries that our scientists make here that help bring jobs and companies uh, to, to Houston. Uh, from the cultural activities here on campus, from our engagement with the medical center and the museums and the nearby museum district. This is really a deeply 
uh, integrated relationship to the mutual benefit of both the university and the city. Well, we're delighted that Rice is a member institution of the Texas Medical Center, very proud of that, and uh, all of the institutions of the Medical Center are very proud of that. Biosciences Research Collaborative at Rice turns out to be a milestone and a marker on the board that says Rice is serious. This is a real effort, really in, in many ways, a university focus for the decades. I think that Rice has been one of the most important educational institutions in the nation. Uh, obviously there are some well-known institutions, the Harvards and the Yales and the Boston Universities and the Princetons of the world, uh, but Rice, down here in the Southwest, has not been given the kind of visibility that it deserves. And I think that it has represented educational excellence during this whole 100 years. What a delight for the Greater Houston Partnership to be a part of Rice University's centennial celebration, which began 100 years ago with the laying of the cornerstone of Lovett Hall. In 1921, President Edgar Odell Lovett said this to the Houston Chronicle. Houston is indispensable to the university for the very simple reason that it is only in a great city that a great university can be built. Rice's impact has been tremendous over this last century and we look forward to the next 100 years. Rice brings great students to a great city and Metrorail helps them explore this city we call Houston. I celebrate Rice because my Rice education gave me an appreciation and an understanding of the wider world uh, that now I have to engage on a daily basis uh, as Deputy National Security Advisor for Strategic Communications. Well, all Texans should be proud of Rice University. Again, this is one of the premier institutes in America, and the Rice University has made tremendous contributions, not just to the Houston area, not just to Texas, but to America. I just want to say, at 100 years, celebrate Rice! Uh, celebrate Rice is a great theme for this uh, 100th anniversary of Rice University. There are a lot of things that the people in Texas around this country can celebrate about Rice University. Well, as we approach our 100th anniversary, I like to think the citizens of Houston have 100 reasons to celebrate Rice, like other institutions that sort of grew up with the, the city of Houston in many respects. We were founded when the city of Houston was a relatively small town of about 70,000 or so. Uh, this is one of the institutions in which re Houston really takes pride. Uh, Houston stands for excellence and achievement and a dynamic spirit and Rice University really represents that. Texas Southern University, the University of Houston, uh, uh, Houston Community College and other colleges here all looked at Rice as being the model for higher education uh, and, and so I think that, that, that that's a good reason for celebrating the centennial of a school that was one thing in 1911 but has grown to be another thing by 2011. There's no way to express how happy we are that Rice is a part of the Texas Medical Center. Well, Rice's impact on the community I think has been extremely significant, as has Houston's impact on Rice. But Rice has uh, contributed uh, so many outstanding people to Houston. It's added to Houston's reputation for excellence. Uh, and it's provided a lot of the energy that Houston is known for. I think the next 50 years will be even more exciting than the first 50 years of human spaceflight. I see continued collaboration with Rice University. And I, I can't think of any way Houston could be the major metropolitan, urban, uh, very sophisticated city that it is today if we didn't have Rice University. Houston is lucky to have Rice University, and Rice is lucky to have Houston. Today we are celebrating Rice University Day here at the Capitol, commemorating the upcoming 100th anniversary of this esteemed university. Joining us on the dais today are some of the distinguished faculty of Rice University. In addition, we, uh, we are lucky to have uh, an honored alum from Rice University, uh, Scott Hawkward. So, so please, please congratulate Rice for turning out with fine leaders. Do you recognize Representative Hawker? Yeah, I, I could do this. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, members, and thank you, Representative Davis, for bringing this resolution. 
You know, we talk a lot about, in this chamber, about creating tier one research universities, and an awful lot of people don't realize that, that we have a crown jewel of a tier one research university in Houston. It's about to celebrate its 100th anniversary. About 50% of the kids, about half the kids who attend Rice University are in STEM fields. So they are doing exactly what we've been trying to get higher education to do. Uh, it's a very valuable asset, and um, they kept me out of trouble for at least five years. And where's Mr. Guerin? Where, wherever, yeah, wherever, wherever Mr. Guerin is, I just want to let him know and let his horn frogs know that our baseball team's on the way back, and we're going to be seeing you in Omaha next time. I'm Jeff Mosley at the Greater Houston Partnership and we celebrate rice. I'm Kay Bailey Hutchison. In Texas and in our nation's capital, we celebrate rice. I'm Mr. Pete Olson. In our nation's capital, we celebrate rice. At the Johnson Space Center, we celebrate Rice University. Celebrate rice. Celebrate rice. Celebrate rice. Celebrate rice. The theme for the University Centennial is Celebrate Rice. But we at Rice celebrate our roots in and our relationship to Houston and Texas, even as we continue to branch out to positively engage not only our city and state, but also our nation and the world. And so we return to the Sally Port. A symbol not only of the living past and the living present of a great institution, but of the living future as well. For through it, incoming, we'll continue to enter new generations of freshmen. And through it, outgoing, we'll continue to issue new generations of graduates equipped to take their place in a challenging world. Good evening, everyone. My name is Chuck Throckmorton, and I am director of bands at Rice. And it's time for the celebration to begin. Now, I can assure President Lieberman that all great universities sing to their buildings. It's just that it usually happens sometime after midnight when all of us are safely asleep. But I can assure you that it does happen on a regular basis. Folks, the mom and I would like to ha ask you for help. We have these dignitaries from the city, the county, and the university, but we would like you to help us celebrate Rice by singing Happy Birthday to Lovett Hall. And we would be very disappointed should you refuse to help us. <laughs> now, after we're done singing and they've blown out the candles, please join us through the Sally Port or around on the other side of the building so we can share some cake together and maybe a little bit more music. We'll just have to see. But first, let's sing. Are you ready? All right. Ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, love at all. Happy birthday to you. There you go. Well done. And as our helicopter accompanies us, now it's time. Folks, come on and join us and let us eat cake. Louis. <laughs> 